Well, Lewis and Chris, it's really nice to see you two in person. I read both your articles from that uh, British convention and really enjoyed them. Uh, well, what, what article? Uh, it was that uh, Tiringham or Tinningham or something? Ah, the Tiringham. Yeah, right, right. Okay, the, about it. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. Yeah, that was a fun gathering. Yeah. I bet yeah, it was. <laughs> Bob, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah. And it's going to be another one, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, um, uh, what is it? Anton, Anton is organizing something in September, also yeah. about energy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it freaks so many people out, you know. I get in trouble because I'm, you know, I'm a therapist, and if I talk about it, oh, they, they don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Topic. There's been a lot of feedback um, in the community. Um, I'd say ninety percent positive, and um, just you know, just a couple people were just had had some reservations about it, like uh, you know, um, scaring people. And uh, it's like, well, so I sent him a free ticket, so hopefully he'll be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, face your fears. Well, as I said in my tearing in peace, in my LSD work, entities have just not been a significant part of that work at all. So Ooh. one of the things I've been trying to think about is why do they show up so much in DMT work and hypnotic work yeah. and uh, psilocybin work, ayahuasca? Mm -hmm. But in my particular modality of working with LSD, it's just not been there. So that's what's a, it's a bit of a puzzle I've thought about some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you've taken big enough doses where you'd expect to. <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah. They're there, you'd see them. <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah. All right. Maybe you need a double yeah. the dose or something. Double dig. No, no. <laughs> yeah. God knows. Please, no, that's no. That's <laughs> Chris, you said you'd stopped, I believe, in that article that you weren't doing this series of high dose LSD. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah, I stopped in '99. And that's that's holding. You're not wanting to go back. No. Yeah, that's holding. It's uncomfortable. You know, that's kind of like. 20 years was enough and I've been, you know, I'd, it's, I've been not doing nothing, but I've been in many ways absorbing those 20 years for the next 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, out of integration. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so much in some ways that I, I don't even know what integration means when you're talking about experiences that are so extreme. I mean, mm. Exp integration makes sense within certain contexts, but then you push the boundaries, and I think we have to develop a new language for what it what it involves. But I'm we'll get to all these things. Yeah, I think I think my maximum was five hundred, no, no, four hundred micrograms, and uh, so. 600 scares me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it should. <laughs> I wouldn't do it the same way if I were starting over again, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you say it was like a typographical thing or you, you thought it was 600, but then uh, it was actually supposed to be 500? <laughs> well, the, the truth was that, yeah, as Stan had said, I had remembered Stan writing in, in LSD psychotherapy that the body's maximum um absorption of the lsd was 600 micrograms so i sort of shot for that and then in writing the book i went back and was checking all my notes again and i saw that he had actually said 500 micrograms <laughs> and i thought i could have saved myself some wear and tear if i had paid more attention to the fine print <laughs> that was in the details <laughs> you know. Uh, for those of you who joined, thank you. Uh, I think we'll wait maybe a couple minutes uh, just for people to stream in because uh, I know we have a, a nice sized crowd here. It looks like um, people are still streaming in. So thank you for joining and uh, just hold tight. Mm -hmm. 
Is there room for us to ask uh, questions of the other panelists, or do you want us to stick of with course, your... Of course, I wanted to stay yeah, feel free. free flowing. Okay. And uh, I mean, as you see, we have tons of questions. We're probably not going to get to all of them. Feel uh, free. But, yep. yep. But we'll, uh, yeah. Because we can yeah, have back to our questions afterwards, but yeah, feel free to uh, ask each other. So. Yeah. I would be very interested in, in a dialogue. I mean, you know, because... Yeah, great. Great. Uh, yeah. More than, than answering, <laughs> you know, but yeah. anyway. I mean, no, that's great. We yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys do what you want, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if it gets derailed, it gets derailed. I'm sure it's going to go yeah. to a wonderful place. You can always bring it back if, uh, yeah, if anything yeah. needs to be. Yeah. I think people are more interested in hearing what you guys say and think than what we pre-formulated mm -hmm. in terms of questions. But uh, we have them here just to start the bowl. Yeah. Luis, where are you come calling in from today? And Bob, where are you from now? Uh, I'm in southern Brazil. I'm in Florianópolis. Oh, you know, great. On the island of Santa Catarina. Uh -huh. Let me see if I could show you. Oh, I cannot show you much. Uh -huh. I don't know if you see it through the... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the sea there. Oh, nice. What time is it? It is uh, five. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, right. East Coast. Hey, I, and Bob, how about you? I'm in the mountains above Santa Cruz. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, well, if if you... I could show you, you could also see the sea out of my uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> your books. Yeah, well, I'm coming to you from Asheville, North Carolina. Great, so, okay. Yeah. So you're in the same time zone as Eduardo. Yeah. Uh, I'm one hour earlier. Oh, I'm okay. Coming up on four o'clock my time. I see. Okay. Oh, yeah. I see. Five. He's four hours. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Hey, uh, since we're waiting for people to come in, and too, I see Dennis McKenna is logged in, and uh, I was going to get let him give a shout out for um, this uh, um, conference coming up. Um, is there a way we can bring him in, uh, Lacey and Paul? Uh, oh, um, I see him listed. Um, I think we just. Let's see. Oh, there he is. Uh, let's uh, let's talk. There he is. See him? I don't see him. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. He's oh, there. Everybody else. Else. Right. Hey, Dennis, uh, can you hear can, us? Hi, can you hear me? I, I don't see any video where I can. We hear uh, you. I, you, you hear me, but you can't see me. Is we see a right? picture. We see a picture of you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you turn on your video. Do you see a video button on the bottom there that you can hit? I don't. Okay. I, I, Let's I see. Can... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. So join this panelist. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Join us. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay. And now I see it. Okay. Okay. Oh, there, there, you are. there you are. All right. Hi, Welcome, all right. Welcome. Very good to see you all. Likewise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to plug ESPD 55. Looking forward to the conversation today. So uh, we're, we're not, the webinar hasn't started, right, Brad? Or, or uh, is, we're, we're letting people stream in still. So this is a good time, actually. Okay. Okay. So, uh, should I just go? Yeah, tell what it, what it is. Uh, how it's yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> a people, All right. A bunch of people are on. So go, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll put the link in the, the uh, chat so people can go there. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good idea. I, I should do that. I'm going to put the, uh, uh, I'm going to put the ESPD 55.com yeah. in the chat. Okay. I right. just yeah, and, and ESPD 55, ESPD stands for the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. This is a five-year follow-up to ESPD 50, which we did in 2017. And, uh, and that was a follow-up. That was a 50th anniversary commemoration of uh, the original ESPD conference in San Francisco in 1967 which was uh, uh, organized by the National Institute of Mental Health. The only thing the taxpayers ever got out of it was the book, the symposium volume, 
which was actually a landmark publication that nobody knows about. So mm -hmm. we decided to redo it 50 years later, and now we're having a five-year follow-up. And uh, take a look at ESPD55.com, look at this schedule, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. We have a number of uh, amazing speakers and topics coming up, including our own esteemed Dr. Luis Eduardo Luna, mm -hmm. who is also mm -hmm. uh, on this uh on this call and Chris, it's nice to see you. You're, you're not on the ESPD 50 pro 55, but maybe next time. Okay. <laughs> it kind of didn't fit, but uh, yeah, please, please look at the website and please feel free to share that with anybody. It, it'll be you know, only about a hundred people at the actual venue in the UK, which is rather amazing venue, but we're hoping to get, you know, global coverage through online streaming. Uh, last time we had 75,000 people uh, for ESPD 50. So we're hoping to crack that and, and even beat that. So anyway, that's my plug. Look at the, uh, look at the chat and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, step back and let you guys take it away. I'm really looking forward to this. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. And, Thank you, uh, Dennis. I'm honored to have okay. you here. And, uh, see you, Dennis. See you. So I guess uh, looks like we've got 65 in 70, so far. 72. People, well, that's including panelists. Right? I see. No, we're, I think we're good. Let's go. Yeah, let's go ahead and start. Uh, you want to start, Lacey? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for coming today. We have a really fascinating discussion coming up on psychedelics and entities with a lot of great speakers here. Um, we're going to have the chat turned off for the majority of the event. We might open it up for the last 15 minutes. Um, and if you have any questions, you can just submit them to the Q&A function. And with that, I'll pass it off to Brad. Thanks, Lacey. And uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm excited to have you be here. This is going to be a, a very interesting panel and uh, hopefully learn a lot about um, through the process. Just a couple of real quick things before we get started. Um, we have the first ever LAMPS Book Club, uh, which is gonna feature uh, Martin Ball discussing his uh, new book that he's edited called Facilitating 5-MeO DMT, an Anthology of Approaches to Serving the God Molecule. Um, I don't know if, uh, Lacey or Paul, if you could drop that. Well, actually it's in the Inventbrite. Uh, I think we have the link yes. there for that. So if you're interested. We've got a lot of great upcoming panels. I'm not gonna read about them here in the interest of time, but, um, I will say we're, uh, Paul and I are working on a couple of the documentaries. One's on psychedelic churches, the other is in psychedelics and recovery. And uh, we're going to start two Indiegogo campaigns to raise funds to finish this. So um, please uh, stay tuned for that. And um, we'll have some interesting incentives uh, to donate for that. Um, other than that, uh, let's see. I think that's all I'll do in terms of. Uh, housekeeping, but I just want to kind of set the stage a little bit in terms of, because, uh, you know, what is an entity? And uh, there's been a lot of interest. I heard a lot of interesting feedback from the community uh, on this topic. And uh, as a lot of you, I'm sure everyone's heard of machine elves. You know, uh, Terrence is uh, famous for talking about machine elves, uh, fairies, elves, sprites, uh, and so forth. I took an energetics course one time when they we're talking about energetic parasites. I guess these uh, things that can latch onto you and suck your energy, I guess. And uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping some of our panels might address that if, if, if uh, that's part of your purview. Um, I'd like to also mention that David uh, Luke, we were trying to get him on the panel as well. He just came, he just wrote a book, which I did have here, but I don't have it anymore. DMT uh, Entities. Uh, uh, Paul, do you remember the exact title? A DMT encounters, I believe. Yeah. And uh, he's been studying this for over 20 years. I remember hearing him on a podcast saying he's been studying this for 20 years, and even he doesn't have, you know, wouldn't say definitively exactly. You know, I mean, he's very cautious about closing his accounts with reality, saying, like, you know, he knows exactly everything that's going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I'd like to suggest we all go into this with an open mind, because I know some people I've talked to just come on one side of the camp or another. And so let's try to get 
give me a bit of a sense of curiosity and uh, see what the evolves from that. Um, let's see. You want to intro the panels, Miles? Yeah, let me just finish this. For, for oh, this. sorry. So, and, and, and other examples are angels, demons, uh, ghosts, um, uh, archetypal things. I remember Ralph Metzger said one time he became Shiva. And uh, so just, um, and interestingly, we're, as we we're coming up this panel, I was looking online and I found this article or this quick, this um, advertisement for request an exorcism today, 100,000 plus people helped. <laughs> and this person does a uh, spirit removal at a distance uh, and it's kind of like a little spiel for that. And uh, so, this is, uh, you know, whether or not, whatever the reality is, this is, you know, being recognized and people are making money off of it. And uh, it's, uh, I'm excited to dive right into it. So let's just, so our panelists, um, as you can see from here, we have Lu Luis Eduardo Luna. And I'm not gonna read all these uh, descriptions they are already in the Eventbrite and in the interest of time, uh, you can read them, but uh, all three of our panelists have very impressive, um, history and credentials. So just take a look at that um, when you get a chance. But Luis Eduardo Luna, who I met in um, Mexico, um, Tochlan for the Ibogaine conference. Uh, I, I actually didn't meet you, uh, Eduardo, I, but I saw you speak with Dennis and uh, excellent talk. Uh, we have Robert Falconer, who we've had uh, in our last <laughs> conference, as well as we did a, a, a separate workshop with him on IFS and psychedelics. And so he has a very interesting take in terms of how this uh, jives with, uh, with um, internal family systems. And I asked him a question one time during that training, how do you know if you're talking to a part or an entity? And his response was very interesting. So I hope you'll be able to go through that again, Robert, uh, if people are interested in that. And Chris Bache, uh, who wrote the book, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, uh, which is one of my favorite books on psychedelics I've ever read. It's fascinating. I think I've listened to it three times and I've probably listened to it again because there's always, there's so much in there that's just amazing. And um, so welcome gentlemen and uh, very happy you're here. <laughs> let's, Thanks, good to be here. Yeah. Let's jump right into this and I apologize. I printed my notes out and they're, they're tiny and I wasn't able to print out another one. So I'll have to read like this, but um, let's see. First of all, have you had personal encounters with entities and what was your experience like? Um, do you want to start, Chris, since you're on the screen? Well, uh, I have had encounters with entities, both in uh, doing past life hypnotherapy work, kind of past life fragments. Um, and uh, I've had contact with entities in ayahuasca context and uh, psilocybin some, but in the pri in my primary work, which is my LSD work where I did, you know, 73 high dose LSD sessions over 20 years. What is striking to me, uh, given the pop this popular topic today is I did not have much contact with entities at all. Um, and so the way I say it is, I did not have much contact with beings, small b, but I had a great deal of contact and communion with being, capital B. Uh, so much so that it, it's led me to really ponder why in one psychedelic context or a hypnotherapy context, contact with beings is pretty ordinary. Uh, and in my LSD work, contact was not ordinary at all. So and we'll, we'll get to it around. But so it's my, my background around this particular topic is um, ambiv ambiguous, I, you might say. Yeah. Can you describe the beings that you encountered with the other medicines and through hypnotherapy? I'm sorry, say again, Brad. I'm sorry, I, I think my microphone's a little uh, be careful. Yeah. Can, can you describe the entities that you encountered with your other medicine work and through the hypnotherapy with the, um, your reincarnation? Uh, in hypnotherapy, it's basically uh, past life mem past life fragments, you know, aspects. I don't think of them as whole past lives, but past life fragments uh, whom I took to be still alive in some kind of... Uh, 
self-defined Bardo reality. Uh, I have a, a good friend, longtime friend and colleague who does uh, clinical past life therapy work and clinical deposition whatnot, has extensive experience with entities much more than I do, not only of unintegrated ego fragments and then past life fragments, but also with kind of dark entities, uh, entities which are kind of obstructive uh, incorporeal uh, entities, but that's just not been my experience personally. Uh, I've had when you know one of my few opportunities of doing ayahuasca. Uh, I was in Brazil uh, participating in an ITA conference, and uh, we were out in the jungle uh, with the Sante Daima community uh, doing ceremony. Uh, and it was having contact with some of the nature spirits uh, in that area. Uh, just lovely, pleasant conversation, pleasant contact. And what was interesting to me is that they said they knew me or could read me. They knew of my work uh, and they were happy to have me in their neighborhood. They wanted to show me around. <laughs> so I said, okay, you know, show, show me around. And they said, well, get out of your body. And I said, I don't get out of my body. It's just not one of the skills I have. And they said, well, we'll help you. So they were kind of my subjective experience was they were pulling on me and trying to get me out of my body. And they were laughing and laughing. They thought it was so strange that somebody who had as much experience traveling in the cosmos as I've had couldn't do something as simple as getting out of his body. They just laughed and after they, they gave up on me eventually and we had a, a, a pleasant, they took me on some adventures that did not involve an out-of-body condition. <laughs> That's great. Um, you mentioned this term clinical depossession. Before we move on, do you, do you mind uh, um, saying what that is? Well, I suspect Robert, Bob could give a better description than I can uh, on that. You want to take that, Bob? Let's go to Bob. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I do largely. Um, yeah. Let's see. Brad, you mentioned that some people are making a lot of money off this. A lot of people have ruined their careers by daring to speak about entities and enti entity removal. Dr. Edith Fior had her license taken away from her because she would she spoke the truth about what she saw and what was going on. And um, I mean, I'm 74 and I don't care anymore, <laughs> to, you know, to hell with them. But if you're a young therapist, you don't want to touch this stuff. If you have any hope of an academic career, you, you don't want to talk about this. You know, it's, it's like the third rail of American psychotherapy. And it's real and it's all, it's, it's actually, I believe, quite common. The first one I met in my, well, I'd met others, but the first one that was really dramatic is I have a very serious eye disease and was told I was going blind about 10 years ago and that I should, you know, learn how to use a cane. And, and I was working with someone on this and we saw this entity inside my eye and it was attacking the retina, which is where the problem was. And the entity looked like a spider with the stinger of a scorpion. And it was causing these holes in my retina and the symptom, the actual biological symptoms of the disease process were blisters on the, my retina, which would then burst and bleed into the eyeball. So, and we were able to get that thing out and I can still see well enough to read and to drive way better than the doctors ever thought possible. And I mean, I still have the condition and get it checked, you know, I do all the Western medical stuff, but that was a very dramatic, <laughs> you know, where it counts, pay attention, pay attention. And then maybe later I'll tell the story of the first other client I had who had a huge one in her and got it out and it, I just wasn't going to ignore this anymore. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Luis, do you want to go next? Um, 
with a have seen entities. <laughs> yeah, what's your, what's your experience with them? Uh, the personal <laughs> okay, okay, I was thinking about that, and um, okay, I mean, I will, I will say um, three situations in which I have seen entities. You know. One is with lucid dreams, you know, somehow, and it was originally due to a plant, uh, which is very common, Brugmansia suaveolens. Uh, it was called Datura arborea. I met in Colombia when I was there at holidays, a German guy who told me, you know, take three flowers of this, um, this um, plant, put it on your forehead and in, in the uh, back of your head, Go to go to your uh, to sleep. Don't move, and when you come back from your dream from uh, from dreaming, don't move and try to remember. Okay, I, I was with Terence, by, by the way, with Terence McKenna and his girlfriend at the time. So we did it, and um, and um, I didn't recall anything. Terence or Erica didn't recall anything. Nothing happened. We thought. Uh, we were in a, in a country house where the Terence and Erica were in one room and I was in the next one. It was a wooden house. And there was a kitchen uh, locked from the outside and the key was in Erica's, with Erica. Anyway, so nothing happened. Uh, Erica went to make coffee, opened <laughs> the lock and found on the pan, on the on the on the uh, grease of the, on the pan or the butter, butter or whatever, you know, just one letter E and with a line on the perfect letter, you know, E. So we couldn't make, what is this? And uh, well, I thought Erica and I'm Eduardo, Luis Eduardo. So perhaps, you know, uh, we met later the, the German guy. And he said, oh, very easily. I mean, one of you went into the kitchen and wrote the E, you know, just to remember. But now you moved, you didn't remember. Okay, anyway, so I didn't pay much attention. I repeated the experiment again a few times. Nothing happened. Then I went to Norway. I was then living in Norway. And I started to have lucid dreams again and again. But I didn't know anybody who had told me what is lucid dreams, you know. So I just realized I was paralyzed. And um, and uh, and I realized that if I didn't panic and I just relax, then I was able to move somehow. I, ha I had the feeling that I was able to move. I, I moved my hands, but my hands were not in front of me. But I had the feeling of of my hands and coming out and touching the walls. And so I started to make experiments on myself. In the beginning, I was very frightened. In fact, I went to a doctor. He said, oh, "You're just dreaming. Nothing," you know. And then I started to see people and, uh, you know, and, and so on. And so I had this whole set of experiences with lucid dreams many years, through many years. And now I don't, I, I don't even, I'm not so much interested in that because I get very tired. It's like I don't, it's like I, I, I do not sleep, you know. So, so um, although it, it's easier from time to time, it happens, I get paralyzed and I can move. Okay, so there's one set of experiences. There's the other one. It's just going into the dream, you know, the, the so-called um, mercurial river, you know, when you are getting into the dream and every night, now I don't recall whether this happened um, at some point, it began to happen, perhaps I just paid attention to that, but every night, for me, entities are just like every, every, every night, before I go to bed, I see them. Dancing, coming close to me, changing, changing, you know, transforming this and that, but it, I, I mean, I I just look at them and, and that's it. I mean, it's just like, okay, welcome to the dream world, and and I go into that, you know, <laughs> so, so there is like everyday experience, nothing. The third one, of course, is ayahuasca. And I have been taking ayahuasca now for 50 years. I mean, I, my first yaje experience was in 1971 with Terence. And so I was almost 25, I'm almost 75. So it's 50 years of experiences with ayahuasca, all sorts of experiences. Also with other with other substances, mushrooms, uh, uh, LSD, but I, I, I never... You know, never uh, 200 micrograms was my, my top, 
It, it was enough. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so and uh, so and 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 with ayahuasca, many kinds of experiences, you know. So now, what do I think about it now? Uh, I, you know, through all these years, what I have come to the conclusion more is that um, we live in an uh, in animistic world. I mean, I'm going back into part of my roots. I'm partly, I was born in the Amazon. My father's side is uh, partly Indian, uh, but I was educated European. I mean, in Colombia first and then in Spain, Norway, uh, Sweden, and so on. So, but I realized that after all these years, when I'm going back, is to animism. And so that means that we are surrounded by entities. I mean, <laughs> simply every animal, every plant that is around us has a spirit somehow. And so the, the question is how to get the sensibility to get in touch with that, you know. Most of the time, of course, we don't because uh, somehow in order to approach these entities, you have to get uh, switch off the logos, you know, the rationality, the radio here, because I live in Brazil and as you know, Brazil and Argentina, they're always, you know, especially in football, you know, so the <laughs> definition for the Brazilian definition of ego is to shut up the, the little Argentinian that we all have inside us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so just switch off the radio and try to perceive directly whatever it is, you know, and, and, and then perhaps it's not a question only of seeing, but of feeling, of somehow tuning in, you know, and being able to receive this kind of information, which is everywhere. Mm. Great. Mm -hmm. hey, can you describe what some of these entities look like? Um, especially the Me? One yeah, Luis. Uh, all, all sorts. All sorts. Little and big ones and <laughs> all sorts. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, you remind me. There was a time which I was almost a little worried because I was taking ayahuasca again and again, and I was going to the same place and almost looking at the same things, you know. I mean, it was just like, you know, I, I somehow I got stuck into one of these worlds with certain entities, you know. And I remember there was a time that they were very curious uh, to look me there, so every time I went in, they were just rushing in, you know, around me, you know, and, and sometimes showing me things, giving me things, but I didn't understand these things, that, you know, that they were like jewels, but I didn't know, you know, sometimes I had to choose and, and I didn't choose because, uh, because I didn't know what was the consequences if I take this or that one, you know, <laughs> a little bit, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, also uh, anthropomorphic, but also all sort of entities, you know. And in fact, you know, perhaps uh, one way to to try to imagine, you know, or, or um, what these entities look like, it will be just looking at the paintings by Pablo Maringo. He has been very clever. Pablo Maringo is, you know, he has, has many, many paintings of entities of all sorts mixed with one in which you have several animals in one, in one entity, you know, or so on. So, so many of them. Um, yeah. So, and sometimes, you know, like, uh, I don't know what is projection. That's the thing, culture, what it is culture, what it is inside you, what it is outside is always this kind of question, you know. Uh, remember once that that I was looking at these beings, and I and I asked, "Who are you?" And the answer was, "We are you." <laughs> and in that state, I was very confused. You, you know, you, so so that's you know for me that's always the the great mystery. And, and I've come to certain, you know, conclusion. I mean, I can never be certain of anything, you know, but that in a way it is, it is like, a, like an interface of my own world, world ideas, being, and something out there. And somehow in the interface, all this is created, you know, and then it's the imagination, you know, in, in, in fact, you know, so all this is created, but now, 
what ultimately is out there, that's, you know, there's a big question. And I don't know whether these entities that we say is separate, perhaps it's just one mind or uh, which is behind and is manifested in many different ways. That That's, uh, you know, the big question. <laughs> well, hopefully we're going to go a little deeper in that and uh, not come up with definitive answers, I'm sure, but uh, we still <laughs> have a little bit deeper into it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, any other... And again, all the panelists, you're able to jump in whenever you want and ask questions or chime in. So before we go on, any, any other comments from? Yeah, I'd like to say something more. Um, I know one of the things I get so much, because I mainly operate in a psychotherapy world where psychedelics are just knocking on the door and people are pretty straight. You know, how can you believe in garbage like that? And, you know, you've been living in California too long. And, and <laughs> comments like that. And, and what I say is, I, I go back to William James, who talked about radical pragmatism and radical empiricism. And I say, I look at what's going to lessen the suffering of the person in front of me. And I have really strong evidence now that by taking these things seriously and working with them, we can lessen the suffering of people in front of me. And I, a lot of times it's a big temptation for me when I'm working with someone, I want to ask the entity all these questions. <laughs> you know, I'm really curious. And I think it's an ethical discipline. That's not what I'm here for. That's not my contract. I'm here to try and reduce suffering. And then a lot of times, even the most rationalistic person can sort of buy into that at least a little bit. And it, and it opens the door. Mm -hmm. I just would like to tag into something that Luis mentioned. Um, I absolutely agree with you, Luis, that um, what emerges in spiritual experience and let's focus on psychedelic experience is an interaction between the mind, which is asking the questions and the larger mind, which is responding to them, or the, the mind which is inquiring and the larger mind which is being inquired into. Uh, it's a my understanding. It's kind of informed by Jorge Ferrer's work, a participatory cosmology, that we don't simply go into a non ordinary state and pluck these experiences off of the tree of the universe, like plucking an apple, but mm -hmm. our being in some way fundamentally evokes out of the infinite potential of consciousness. It evokes a certain set of experiences, which is not to say that they are projection, but the way I understand it is consciousness, cosmic mind is an infinite potential, and our mind acts as a seed catalyst that we throw it into that soup and it catalyzes a certain set of experiences out of the infinite potential. As we absorb those experiences and are purified by those experiences and are expanded by those experiences, uh, we are changed. The seed catalyst of our mind is changed so that in subsequent sessions, when we go into non-ordinary states, it, it catalyzes a different and deeper uh, experience out of this infinite consciousness. And it just keeps going. So it, it, to me, the participatory uh, understanding of what happens in psychedelic states is, the, is not the end of the conversation. It's the beginning of the conversation because then it becomes how much have you been purified? How much have you um, erased your habitual patterns? Uh, and because the more you have, the more deaths you've gone through, the more purification processes you've gone through, the more the universe opens up deeper and deeper levels of its, of its mysteries. And in one particular, and let me tag on another piece of what Louis had said. In one particular session, I remember I was in dialogue with, I always have a felt sense of being in dialogue or guided by my sessions or orchestrated by consciousness. It never takes a particular form, never takes a shape or form, but there is an acute sense of, of presence, which I'm engaging. And uh, in one particular session, after going through a number of experiences, I said, who am I talking to? Who are you? 
And in that process, I went through a death, re a death experience. I kind of collapsed into a deeper level of reality where I discovered that I was in fact in dialogue, this other was myself. And then again, the, the process repeated itself, who are you? And in this session, I went through hours of going through death after death after death when I would ask the question. And I found that all otherness in my session was at a deeper level emerging out of a coherent oneness. Now, that doesn't mean that my ego or personal unconscious was generating my, my experience. It wasn't like a confrontation with my personal psyche, but that the, uh, the oneness that I died into was really coming out of a deep, deep level of cosmic being. It was that kind of oneness. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, this fluidity between self-other at one level and the dissolving of self-other at another level is, a, is not simply, um, it's not resolved at one time at one level, but it, it goes through level after level after level, deeper and deeper levels of communion, and then absorption, and then initiation into these, these deep strata uh, of the cosmic mind. Mm -hmm. Right, we can't hear you. Thank you so much for that, Chris. That was fascinating. And uh, again, everyone should get the book, um, the LSD in the Mind of the Universe, uh, dives deep, real deeply into these things and it's, uh, you won't regret getting the book. Uh, this next question is kind of- um, You know, you could, you're, you're reminding me of one experience that I had, that the, the terrible realization was that I was everyone. <laughs> that I could be the worst criminal, the worst person, you know, the best one, but that, that, that it was essentially me, you know, <laughs> it, it was really horrible <laughs> because they didn't say, oh, well, I am this and I'm that as well, you know, so, okay, so, yeah. We're <laughs> all one, ahead. we're all one. <laughs> we become one with God, so to speak, if we use the classical language, and if God wow. is totality of existence, then we are, we merge with the totality of existence and we see ourselves in, in, in all the forms of life. And we, you know, we, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a devastating experience, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because we have the division of good and evil and all these and that. We have all these categories and, 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 and how, you know, how can we fit into that, you know? Yeah. It reminds yeah. me, I was drinking ayahuasca in the Sacred Valley. Um, I was having a conversation with the um, with Mother Aya, or, son, or I forget what the circumstance was, but it was about Dick Cheney. And I was just saying, oh, God, I just hate Dick Cheney. And the response was, what are you talking about? You are Dick Cheney. Yeah. kind of humble. <laughs> so, so the next question has kind of been already I mean I think we already know the answer to a certain extent but it's um is talking about entities more helpful or harmful and they uh, just behind this is uh, someone brought up the thing where you know if someone's going to go in to say and to drink ayahuasca do you really want them to fill fill them with a fear of like entities like oh my god do you like could I get possessed by an entity or do I need to protect myself or what can I do um, so, Luis, you want to start with that one? Since uh, well, um, uh, I think that I think that uh, it, I think it's only Western. You know, I, I, I mean, it's difficult to say. You know, in general terms, you know, but with this, uh, we have deprived the world we have disenchanted the world of entities you know and so and so this idea that oh you may see entities you know therefore you have to be afraid and, and i think that simply we we have to re recognize that this is part of what it is you know that the entities are everywhere 
the interpretation, which are whether they're good or bad, it all depends on you know many of many things, including our own situation at that very moment, and so on. So, so uh, my 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 take into this one when people ask me what happens if I see a terrible entity here, monster coming to me, is uh, um, uh, I used to tell them. Okay, if you see a great serpent, a serpent coming to eat you, just go in, go inside, let to be eaten, let to be destroyed. It's yeah. the game. Okay, just take me, you know, we'll do whatever, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because by accepting this, then suddenly you realize, you know, that there is no, no danger really, you know, and yeah. then you learn something. You know, so so I, I was reading. I, there is a book that I am really recommending every every time I give a talk. Is David Kopanawa's book, um, um, "The Falling Sky." It's a book uh, written by uh, Bruce Albert and David Kopanawa. But David Kopanawa is a, a um, um, Yanomame shaman. And Bruce, this is the result of something like 20 years of collaboration. So in the book is really David Kopanawa who is talking. You know, they are his words. You know, mm -hmm. and and it is a, a extraordinary. You know, because because then you see how uh, in order to be a, a, in in this society, in order to be able to understand the world, you have to really have to die. I mean, but they say it is. You know, that is. That is the whole experience is dying when they take, they take yakoana, which is a, a, snob, a snob made from virola uh, plant and it contains 5 methoxy DMT. I mean, and, and that's serious. I don't know if you any of you have experience with 5 methoxy DMT is beyond DMT. I mean, it's just really serious stuff, you know, yeah. and they are able to die, you know, and, and and only by dying, then you are able to understand, you know, what is uh, what is happening, you know. And then you get in touch with all these um, fantastic entities and all uh, and all that. So, so well, I think that that's the process. It, yeah, the process that we need to go through somehow is just to die. And interesting that uh, David Kopanawa said that in dreams, the same thing. You know, we have to learn how to dream. He said that we Westerners, we dream, they are, we are just like axes or, you know, pieces of uh, stones on, on, on the Maloka, and we don't do anything with our dreams. Mm -hmm. And that made me think that, you know, we have how in the Western world we have neglected uh, the dreams. I mean, in, in, in the Western world, I mean, we put an alarm clock, we take a coffee <laughs> and there's no chance that we are going to remember anything, you know, because we simply destroy but in all, so many societies, including the Western uh, Amazonian society, the dream well is another state of consciousness in which they are dealing with, they are meeting people, meeting entities, meeting, you know, meeting imagination, in, you know. So, so it's a completely different thing, you know. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And I, I'm realizing I, we should have made this a five hour long session instead of two. <laughs> 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 Robert, do you want to um, talk about this? Um, sure. Um, a lot of the work I do is preparation sessions and integration sessions before and after. And I, you know, I, I come from a parts model of the mind. We're, our mind is not one unified thing as we walk around the world. There's little kids in us and rebellious teenagers and cranky old people and all that. And that, I believe this is actually healthy and good. But so what I do is I ask someone, find any parts of you who are scared of meeting entities. Ah, I see. And then I have them develop a relationship with this part. How do you feel towards the part? Can the part feel you there with it? Until that part feels so secure in the relationship with the real self or the central self that it's no longer afraid of the entities. And I really work, I, it's, I think it is so great that we're talking about this because it, it gives you the opportunity to work with people before their medicine session, you know, and meet all the parts of them who are scared by this and make that all. And if, if you can't get that really good self part relationship, 
you can negotiate with that part to go to some safe contained space you know uh, but i yeah it's i think it's super important we talk about this and wonderful and we should do more of it <laughs> i agree and uh if I, could, if I could tag into both what Luis and, and Bob are saying, that um, entity, the universe is just abounds with life, with living beings. And in the physical, I mean, it was Robert Monroe, I think, the, you know, uh, the out-of-body guy who wrote several books in the Monroe Institute of Applied Science. He said, there are as many levels of beings, as many beings in the spiritual world as there are beings in the physical world. So there's uh -huh. just billions and billions of beings. What, what saddens me is that when people begin to ask the question about entities, they the fear comes in and they the assumption is that these you know i think it may be this christian or religious heritage where there are demons and what once you leave the cognitive mind you're threatened to be over you know taken possession of by demons and it's it's not that there aren't shadow elements to deal with or there aren't you know dark forces that one has to deal with but the vast majority of intelligent life in the universe is not of that nature at all. And the deeper you go into the universe, the deeper you're dealing with luminous, luminous, luminous beings that, that we are like, we're like children to them. I mean, they're just extraordinary beings of, of great genius and, and great compassion and great love. And it's like, you know, Hollywood has, has distorted our, under, our image of what the spiritual world is like, so that it's filled us with images of ghosts and, uh, you know, all sorts of, of fearsome beings or demonic and possession beings, when really uh, the, the reality is quite different from that. So there's two cents. Can I, I want to jump in on that, because I think domination structures worldwide get their power by keeping people from making contact with their inner realities. Mm -hmm. You can see that the early church, the early Christian church, the very earliest Christian church, everybody was in contact with the Holy Spirit and got these healing powers and all that. And then once there was an organized center, they said, no, 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 you guys can't do it, only us priests. Mm -hmm. And it happens, it happens in tribes, it happened in India, there's a, a long history of possession stuff in India. So I think domination structures are very interested in keeping us scared of that inner world. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to talk about this, sort of counter that propaganda that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The movie, The Exorcist, is there, um, well, just, just quick thoughts about The Exorcist. I'm sure you've all seen the movie, right? Um, and that scared yep. a lot of people for demonic possession and uh, I'm thinking, oh my God, am I possessed? Uh, did anyone want to talk about that? Um, your experience and thoughts about that movie? Not really. It's not <laughs> worth talking about on the large landscape. It's not <laughs> really. It's not that there aren't dark forces that one must contend with, but I, the vast majority of spiritual forces, I think, are much are benign and and uh, compassionate and helpful and constructive. It's just that we we get fixated on these scary things that just kind of lock us up, and uh, it's like. You know, we are, we are coarse. We're like, like Bob says, we're not, it's, a, we are many parts and we want those parts to be singing together in a chorus. Most of our parts sing pretty well together. You know, maybe we got a couple of hand holdouts. Maybe we got to work with and some scared parts or some angry parts or whatnot, but most of them are, are really work well together. You know, Chris, you made me think of something that, um, Jordi Riva, you know, the great uh, Spanish who worked for many years uh, on ayahuasca. Uh, um, um, I, once I, I met Jordi in Barcelona and asked him, okay, you have been working for so many years as a scientist with ayahuasca. How can you, how you can, please make me a, a resume, you know, if, in a few sentences. What is ayahuasca for you? Yeah. And then he said something like, like it, it is like, um, 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 
with ayahuasca, the main conductor of the psyche just calms down and let allow all these other voices which are there come to the front mm -hmm. and, 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 and speak and I talk. And that's, you know, in a way, what you say, you know, I mean, the, that is this big conductor, conductor that we think it is me, you know, and in fact, it's made of many different others. Yeah. And perhaps this is what we have to learn how to, you know, gradually shut the Argentinian in a way going to this, <laughs> so that the others, so that the others can come up. <laughs> yeah. I want yeah. to add one more thing to that. I really appreciate you, both of your comments. I think even the ones that come out like these horrible, horrible, nastiest dark force, ah, you could imagine. Yeah. Almost all of them are really just lost, frightened souls who yeah. are desperate and terrified on their own and yeah. just need a little help to turn and, and go away from that. And they can, they can transform quite quickly if, if they're met with compassion. And if you meet them like the exorcist did, that kind of stuff is so, so stupid. I'll just go ahead and be judgmental. <laughs> you meet them with that nasty energy, they're gonna, they're gonna escalate. And it, it, you know, you got this big dramatic thing and the exorcist gets to think of themselves as this heroic, you know, conquering hero. I think that's all wrong, unnecessary. Befriend them, they're lost. They're suffering intensely. Yeah. They need some help. Yeah, and when they're shown the light, they go to the light because their nature is of the divine. I mean, this it's all of the divine. There is no being in existence that is not of the divine nature. And so they get caught off in shadow material and alienated and angry and frightening and, you know, but when they are reintroduced to the light, as I'm sure you do all the time, Bob, when they see the light, they spontaneously want to return to the light they, when they feel the love and compassion that's available to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I was working in, uh, um, with the Barquinha. I don't know if you have heard, uh, all of you have heard Santo Daime and yeah. some of you, UDV, you know, there yeah. are these two big organizations that take ayahuasca as, as a sacrament. But there is another one, which was, uh, at least in the 90s, was not yet studied. And, and I, I was lucky to, they let me in and, and spend a long time with them. It's called the Barquinha, the little boat, you know. And um, also founded by somebody from the, from the um, um, Brazilian uh, Northeast, which is very Afro, so mixed with Afro-Brazilian elements and so on, possession and so on. Uh, yeah, and um, but the main work of the Barquinha is not the human beings. They have Wednesdays, I think they have like open for, for people to come to uh, get advice from the spirit of the Pretos Veio, the old slaves and so on. But the main task of the church is to lead those spirits which are suffering yes. into the light. That is the main thing, you know. I was I was amazed. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Well, we've gone through two out of the 23 questions we have. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so glad, I'm happy with this. I mean, I, I, I think it's a better than we planned. So um well, I'm I'm going to frustrate you for asking question number three because I want to go back to something Louis said and and re, uh, reinforce this, and that is the value of death. I mean, death is what most people are afraid of dying, but in psychedelic work, you learn just the opposite: that death is your friend. Uh, death is the doorway to liberation. Staying death is what allows us to become large and what allows us to become intimate with the deeper fabric of the universe. And so in the beginning, you know, it's frightening and the ego clutches and, but you go through your first ego, you go through ego death, but the death process doesn't stop with simply the death of ego. You die not only as an individual human being deeper, you die as a human being per se, you, you leave hum your humanness behind, you die as a time space being, eventually death becomes uh, something one seeks after, because one's learned that whatever you're dealing with, whatever is confronting you, whatever is scaring you, 
Uh, if you surrender to it, like Louis says, let the snake eat you and give yourself over to it, then you go through some type of dying, surrender, absolute destruction, and you are carried into something new. You, you literally become a new kind of being, experiencing a new dimension of reality. Once you go through this process multiple times at multiple levels, you realize that you can't really die. You die, but you always come through. So you can't die. So you, for me, I began to understand that when death is actually a form of purification, when purification reaches so deep and you're letting go of some fundamental assumption of, of what you think is real or what you think you are, and you're letting go of it, then uh, you're being purified. And when purification reaches into the fundamental structures that hold your consciousness in a particular configuration, it has reached what I call purification unto death. Hmm. And that's in purification unto death liberates you into a deeper experience of the universe. So to me, all death in a, in a psychedelic context is all about purification. It's all, it's all purification because the mind that we wake up into is the same mind that we had at the beginning of our very, very first day of life. It's just that in our first day of life, it's often encumbered or qualified or, 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 or kind of just encumbered in some way. But when we lose those encumbrances, the mind that we wake up into, the radiant splendor of the divine mind is, is our essential nature, is the nature that's always been there. You know, So death is simply just waking up into deeper and deeper levels of our own being. Two cents. <laughs> I don't know if you guys oh. seen the movie Jacob's Ladder. Um, mm. It's a beautiful quote, uh, quoting Meister Eckhart, saying, "You know, if you're frightened of dying, you know, and you might imagine demons ripping you apart. But if you surrender and you're you make peace, then uh, you actually see their angels uh, helping you yeah. break free." And, uh, I, I yeah, probably butchered the quote, but it's something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Paul, um, <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> so, go ahead and take the next question. Uh, just... uh, absolutely. I was going to ask something that in, in order, but um, this discussion of what you guys have just mentioned um, lead me to ask a, one more point on, on what we're talking about as far as is it, is it uh, healthy to be discussing demons and is it, is it uh, beneficial? Um, I had, a, I had a, um, a, a meeting with some very deeply religious friends uh, last week and they were they were horrified to hear about my psychedelic use and their main concern was that this is uh, a possible by doing psychedelics it's a possible entry point uh, to a demonic demonic realms demonic possession now these are people that are not likely in the near term to be using psychedelics but would each of you um, suggest a response to such a person a deeply religious person I mean Robert you mentioned that you know it's it's the um, religious hierarchy, kind of con con controlling the dialogue, controlling how this gets talked about and, and laying on fears as so as if they're the ones that should be defining all this. So I'm not going to, I'm not likely to turn around and attack the religion, but would you, res would you suggest a response that would be helpful to them as far as, you know, what's going on here and how it would be benef why it's beneficial to be, to be engaging in psychedelics and not worry so much about you know, um, demonic possession and things of that nature. You want to, you want to take, you, Chris, you're on screen as far as in front of me. So you want to take that first, as far as what you would say to a deep religious person about this type of thing? Well, I'd first want, if it were a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'd want to know more about their particular religious orientation. We'll start there. Okay. Basically, I would remind them that as a, as a family of substances, psychedelics are simply amplifiers of consciousness. They simply amplify and augment consciousness. How you use those hours of augmentation 
makes all the difference in the world. If you use them to become more aware of your own being, if you use them to confront everything which you're scared of or anything which is bothering you or any little cheaty thing that you've got running around in your life, if you use it in that way, you begin this process of going through a spiritual transformative process. Uh, and it's... <laughs> You know, my understanding is what happens in an LSD or any psychedelic session is the same thing that's happening in life, except faster. In life, we are constantly confronting ourselves. We incarnate to engage karma, uh, or we, we are confronting some aspect of our life, uh, and we manage it hopefully well, maybe not so well, hopefully well. And then we die and we return to a deeper state of awareness. And then we incarnate again and we engage and we learn and grow and whatnot. And same thing happens. It's just that we're engaging ourselves, learning as we go, becoming more than we were before. But it's a long, slow process. When you meditate, when you concentrate your mind and you really focus your mind toward the center of your being. And if you use the amplified states of psychedelics in that manner, you begin to burn off the karmic layers which are driving your incarnational process and you speed up this process. So in a way you confront your, it's your demons, you're confronting your demons, but not really demons that are terrifying the universe outside. You're really starting with your own shadow. And as your shadow is cleared, your, your mind becomes clear, your heart becomes clear, you become more compassionate, more understanding, more sympathetic. Uh, and that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't that what the religion would affirm? So it's really, I think it's a misunderstanding of one, what psychedelics are, what they do to us. And secondly, uh, it's a, it's a, a too small cosmology. It's, it's a small cosmology of what the spiritual world is actually like. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. You just want to speak up, Robert? You want to come in? Okay. Oh, yeah. I have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you mind? Because I get a lot of people who've had some kind of psychedelic session and are destroyed. You know, parents calling, ah, our daughter did that and she's in the mental institution. And what, what do we do? Wow. You know, I get a lot of that. And um, the first, first thing I'd say is that as difficult as these transitions are, when, when, a, when a negative entity gets into us, it actually is doing us a favor unintentionally. It's like the ants in your kitchen. They're not trying to help you out, right? Obviously but they will show you precisely where you spilled the food. Hmm. <laughs> They'll show you exactly what you need to clean up. Hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so these negative energies are exactly like that for us. The problem is not the negative energies. The problem is our fear and terror of them. Mm -hmm. so I, I go back to that, find the parts who are terrified of this, work with the terror. And when working with very religious people like mm. that are saying you're going to open yourself up and you're going to get demons in, I work with, I would want to ask them about their fear of demons. And, you know, if, if they're Christian, well, aren't you saved? Isn't Jesus much more powerful than the demons? Why are you scared of these guys? Yeah. And I know among Orthodox Jews, there's very extensive psychedelic use now in a very religious framework. So some of the most intensely religious people, you know, who, whose whole lives are organized around their, their religious disciplines are becoming very, very interested in psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Luis, want to comment? Um, no, um, I just had a memory of um, a sentence you know, we're talking about death and confronting your, your demons and so on. Yes. And in Mount, Mount, Mount Athos in Greece, mm -hmm. there is this monastery. In the door of the monastery, there is a sentence. If you die before you die, you don't lie when you die. 
And I think that the, the whole thing is a fear, fear, you know. So so my 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 advice to these people is just don't don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid, you know, confront it, you know. It is those demons perhaps are not coming from the outside, they're coming from within you. And you have to better, you know, get, get, get to know what you got inside. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, I've got a um, uh, two different uh, two different approaches to entities. Uh, some say that entities uh, tend more uh, tend to be encountered by people that are highly suggestible, by open to hypnosis. Whereas another definition of entities are that it's a protective; it's almost a, a genetic protective ability, such that, like in in the jungle, the people that could sense seeing the the feel the tiger behind the bushes or sense another person that might bring them harm. For the three of you, what's what's your take on what's going on with entities? Are are is it more likely that people are open to suggestion and and so they're going to see these things or feel they they feel that the things are there, or is it more like they're they're more more acute, but they can sense the people that are seeing entities are more can more sense such a such presence? Do you have an opinion about about these takes, or is it a third definition as to why people uh, see entities? Um, Chris. <laughs> no. <laughs> or, or, Thanks a lot, Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Don't take away. <laughs> you know, uh, the the problem I have is that we have the category entities. Yeah. And okay. it's as if we're talking about one thing or yeah. two or three, when really we're talking about there's so many, many different forms of entities and so many layers of entities and, and so many uh, categories that it's okay. I can't I can't think of uh, if you answer the question the way I think it's being framed uh, you end up and addressing just the lowest level of entities just right. the near the nearby entities mm -hmm. which which are real they're they're there but they're in some ways the least significant ones you know because if you if you deal with that fear and you work through those, then you eat much more interesting beings okay. and you much more interesting layers of being. So it's a hard question to answer on its own, on those terms for me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Luis, do you have any thoughts on that? Mm. Well, I mean, we, we talk about people who are more sensitive, more, uh, 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 we almost in negative uh, terms, you know. Yes, Our people, yeah. are, you know, you know, and and it is like we are we are uh, uh, damning imagination, <laughs> yes. you know, and, yes. and, and yes. that is a terrible thing to do, you know, yeah. because is we are reducing ourselves to you know our logos, our rational mind, and all the other things are just imagination. Yes. So yeah. so 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 we need to be. You know, if you are open in that way, then then you you know you see or you connect with or you know you see these multiple entities, and in a way that's what happens. You know now with the animistic societies. You know they are open to all these, and and, and therefore they are able to sense also the 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 more closest entities here, like the jaguar, which is behind. You know, okay, you feel that. You know, you feel all that, but also that jaguar. You know, so that you know, so in a way, these are people who are much more, and and not only see. That is the thing. You know, we are a very very visual, um, a very visual uh, culture. You know, but it's just like perceive on multiple levels. You know, I mean, we don't think much about the smell of the forest, you know, I mean, that is one of the things that they said that you learn when you are learning uh, with ayahuasca and all the plants is just to open to yourself to the multiple levels, you know, <laughs> uh, right. of smell, of of feeling, of, of many different dimensions. So it's a completely different thing. And of course, then you, of course, you, 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 you see that the, that the world is populated by multiple entities of all sorts, you know, so, yeah. So that is my take. <laughs> sure, sure. Robert, got something to say? Yeah, this is a fascinating question I've thought about a great deal. There is, uh, I think, in my mind, the foremost anthropologist living today is Tanya Luhrmann. 
And she wrote, one of her many books is How God Becomes Real. And she studies the things in all sorts of different cultures all over the world as to what people do that makes God and these experiences of entities and spirits real to them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's learnable. <laughs> She's come to the con conclusion, you can learn how to do this. And she doesn't talk about demons or angels, entities or anything. She talks about spiritual presence experiences. So I think, Chris, this is like, it's much bigger than just entity. It's this great big thing. And there are many academic scales that measure our openness to this stuff. Tanya prefers the absorption scale, the Telengen absorption scale. There's also one, I like the name, the sensory delight scale. <laughs> <laughs> it's how much pleasure you can, that predicts how much of this you'll know. There's also Stanford hypnotizability, and there's, there's a lot of ways to measure them. On the clinical end, there's what they call schizotypy and psychoticism measures. And on all of these, even the ones that are supposed to be measuring mental illness, the higher up you get, the more creative people are. I see, I see. <laughs> I mean, you don't get one without the other. Yeah. And there's one that's very interesting. They can, using computers, they can predict if, if you're given a certain word, there's a certain uh, probability that other words will occur around it. Like if mm -hmm. you say roof, somebody's pretty likely to say top or, you know, and they have this, they have these statistics all drawn out. They show that they can use this to test this because they show that people who are way up here, that their field of association is much bigger and much looser. And of course, if you go too far, you get people talking word salad. Right, right. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think this, I think, I think somebody could write a great book tracing the history of the Western world in terms of how we've dealt with spiritual presence experiences. Right, right, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Brad, you wanna ask something? Oh, no, oh, I'm good. You wanna keep going? I mean, I room for a whole lot. I, I think we, you know, I hit, I, I got the answers on that one, so go ahead and put another question. Okay. Um, so can you discuss how different medicines elicit different entity experiences, such as a DMT, Iboga, LSD, mushrooms, ketamine, um, in other medicines or drugs? In your experience, how do the entities um, uh, encountered using ayahuasca compared to the, those encountered in the uh, Changa or DMT space? So essentially just, um, and, and uh, Chris, you already alluded to this in terms of LSD, not encountering entities uh, per se in, in as much maybe, but um, can, you, can you talk about the other medicines like such as iboga, ketamine, so forth? I'm gonna lateral this one to Louise, I think. You should start this conversation, Louise. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but I was thinking, you know, in fact, I don't have so much experience with other things, you know, I've been being quite conservative in a way, you know, mm -hmm. I never take any boga, although it was open and, and pity the, the time that the, the should come, they could not make it. I have one experience with ketamine, just one intra, in, uh, intramuscular, which made me think that uh, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to, not to be able to move if if the house is is burning, you know. Uh, I mean, you know. So, so I didn't like this uh, paralysis, and I didn't encounter anything interesting. But it's only one experience, and I know many people who have had all sorts of experiences, extraordinary ones, you know. So I cannot I cannot judge judge that. Now my experience with ayahuasca have been in a way similar to the mushrooms, and I'm more more um, familiar with the mushroom world, much less. But anyway, I've had some, and I can even perhaps tell one, which I think it is uh, it is interesting. Um, it was in Mexico. Um, Terence had given me five grams of uh, of psilocybin mushrooms, mm. um, and and and. 
for him, five grams is the minimum. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, so wow. okay, so and I was uh, going traveling to Mexico, and I was and I went to Palenque, and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to do it in Palenque, and uh, took a bus to uh, Palenque, see the ruins, uh, decided for a place uh, uh, on, you know, on one of the, the pyramids, and then on my way back. I met um, a, a guy, an American guy, who was selling small jewelries and uh, obviously stone, <laughs> as mm -hmm. we spoke, you know. And but anyway, I I, I thought that I thought that was interesting because he said, you know, some people come to Palenque and take LSD, and you know, the only and I have also taken LSD there. The only thing I saw was fucking coral snakes, you know. Okay, so <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, I became interested in this guy anyway, you know, because he had experience and I was thinking to have a trip in Palenque, you know. So so, so we went for, for a coffee in a place and then suddenly a Lacandon young, uh, Lacandon Indian appeared, very beautiful with some talisman, joined <laughs> us and somehow the American left. And I was with this, uh, uh, with this uh, a guy and... And I was uh, explained to him, I'm going to take uh, mushrooms uh, uh, tomorrow night. He said, if you do that, you are going to die. And I said, oh, I'm glad to do it, you know. And, <laughs> so, and, and he said, okay, well, then I am coming with you. Okay, so we made an appointment. He came the next day uh, with a young guy. He, uh, this this the Lacandon was about, I would say, young, 25 or something like that, came with a, with a young 18 year old uh, who was studying with him, you know, so <laughs> young people. Um, and, uh, and so went to a place, I took as much as I could for the five grand with honey, you know, it's just quite a lot stuff. So I could not take any more. And there was a little bit in, on the spoon and the Lacandon took it, you know, and then the, the young guy, 18 years old, just took the, whatever it was left in the spoon and, and, you know, just took the little bit, you know, and, okay. And so we went off at night to Palenque walking. Uh, <sighs> it, it was so strong for me, you know. I at some point I simply I was not able to walk all the way. Oh, impossible! So I said, "Look, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we stop here, you know, I can, you know." And and then we stopped the three of us, and and I was recording a conversation with 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 this Lacandon, and suddenly we were surrounded by these little people. I didn't see them. But I could hear them all around. <laughs> and the Lacandon said he was able to touch one of them. And the young guy, 18 years old, he was just jumping. He was totally frightened, you know, because he was saying, uh, uh, I catching go, I catching go, mama, you know, you know, the typical Mexican, totally terrified. Yeah. But we had a experience, the three of us. I mean, there was no doubt. And uh, just remember, one more thing that happened that night is that so we were sitting and this Lacandon was my teacher and was telling me something that I have to, you know, learn. To. But then suddenly with another moon in another place, I was teaching him. And it was this, this very strange relationship of being at the same time a student and a teacher, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this is one of the few ex experiences I, I don't have many so many emotions but it was stuck like very interesting i mean and i don't know yet what to make out of it hmm right right hmm. Robert, next? yeah um i don't think the particular medicine used is that significant mm -hmm. yeah uh, most of the people I deal with have not done any medicine at all. <laughs> you know, and a lot of people have experience of these things just walking around the planet in their ordinary lives. And our society is so unsupportive of people with psychic abilities that they don't dare talk about it because they're, they're afraid they'll be locked up 
yeah. or ridiculed or, you know, so then they end up completely isolated with these experiences with no one to talk to. And it becomes very, very, very difficult. Whereas most of the time, these experiences could be a wonderful blessing if it was held differently. And I think as, as I study the, this more cross-culturally, I think the cultural container these kind of experiences come into is so important. In one cultural container, you'll get locked up and given horrible psychoactive drugs and put in restraints. And another cultural container, there'll be a ritual around you and it will be a blessing for the whole community. Right, and right. Turn something that could be wonderful into shit over and over and over again. And I heard this one guy who, for, of African descent saying a modern psychiatric diagnosis is a curse, just like uh -huh. our ancestors used to curse people. It's exactly uh -huh. the same. Right, right. With the psychedelic res renaissance, are you hopeful, Robert, that, um, that things will open up, that it will be more accepting and more more able to use such things? Very much so. Yeah. Very, yeah. very much so. And I think an another another good point, <laughs> another good point is the mental health, health system is failing or has failed. Yeah. And the former institute of the National Institute of Mental Health, the former director of that, just wrote this big book saying we've failed. So even the people at the top are opening up a little bit. We have to do something different. We, we just absolutely have to do something different. And it, that's one of my passions. And I think this one-on-one -on -one therapy model that I've been involved in my whole life, it can't, it's, it goes up linearly at best. We need something exponential. So, mm -hmm. so we need whole new models, psychedelic medicine, supported yeah. peer counseling. I, I always mispronounce this word, promentora. The, promentora. Uh, the, the promoters. They're, they're health workers who go out with minimal training into the communities. They have a lot of them in the farm labor camps here in California. That, so, something that can reach a whole lot more people than we're Mm. getting to now mm. yeah we need facilitators of some sort they need they don't need to have degrees in psychology or all these or that you know but people who have experience and who are able to to teach other people you know mm -hmm. uh let me th throw out an idea that bears on this question of um which psychoactive drugs might trigger entity experiences or non-entity experiences, um, a suggestion. I'd be interested in, in what you guys think of this. Uh, my proposal would be that the experience we have on a psychoactive substance is not simply a biochemical uh, reaction of this substance in our, in our body, in our brain, but that uh, around every so active psychoactive substance is a kind of more what Rupert Sheldrake would call a morphogenetic field. Mm -hmm. That all the people who have ever taken this substance, their experience with this substance forms kind of a field around this substance. So that, and of course, the organic psychedelics, which have a history going back thousands of years, that's thousands of years of humanity having experiences with this substance so that when a, a new person in the 21st century takes this substance, it's not simply a biochemical reaction inside their body to the substance, but they are in a degree engaging the field around this substance. And that's why I think perhaps someone who does ayahuasca in Brooklyn, who's never been to South America, can all of a sudden be having a very powerful experience of a, of a anaconda or a, a, a python or a puma when they've, you know, it's just not part of their world, but it is part of the world of the gen of the people of the civilizations who have taken this material. LSD 
is an example of a drug which is relatively new on the scene. And the number of people who have taken it compared to psilocybin or ayahuasca is very few, and it hasn't had time to develop a very strong field around it. So I think this is why, perhaps this is why some people would describe LSD as being clean. They experience it as clean. It has a psychoactive property, but it, it doesn't seem it's not like psilocybin. And I don't think it's simply the difference between organic and synthetic. I think it has something to do with the fields associated, psychoactive fields associated with these substances. Does this make sense to you guys? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I had a conversation with Rupert and uh, Rupert Sheldrake and Terence and Jeremy just about that many years ago in London. And, and it seems to me that the, what you say, Chris, and Rupert, I acknowledge it, you know, there is some kind of feel. The more people do it, the easier it's getting, you know, somehow. So, so, so uh, uh, many of the first experiences you read about ayahuasca, people are terrified. Now people get into, into that. But of course, as you said, you, we need trained people because yeah. otherwise... Uh, um, it can be quite quite damaging. In fact, I know a Chilean psychology, psychology therapist in 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 California who she says, "I just take care of the people who come back from Peru, completely screwed up mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. taking ayahuasca there." You know, and mm-hmm. so so yeah yeah yes yeah. I think all of us would agree. Uh, we are all in this panel pro-psychoactive substances, pro-psychedelics, and are at the same time uh, are very concerned about people who take psychedelics under less than ideal circumstances and can they can hurt themselves and do damage and, and it can take years perhaps to undo some of the things which are done. In a safe context, well-managed sessions can be very beneficial in an unsafe or, or, or not well-managed situation can be very detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In, the, in the underground here in Northern California, there seems to be a sort of standard of practice for serious people who are giving psychedelics illegally they typically will start with MDMA. And then after a while, they'll start introducing low amounts of psilocybin with the MDMA. And then Mm -hmm. they'll lower the amount of MDMA and increase the amount of psilocybin until eventually at some point in the future, it's all psilocybin. Are you guys guys aware of that kind of practice? Do you have any comments about that? I don't have any experience, but it sounds interesting. I know, I know a therapist. I cannot say her name, who, who, who has been doing this uh, with MDMA and, and LSD as well. M- MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. But in her, in her case, more LSD because psilocybin, pure psilocybin is difficult to get. You know, but yeah, it seems interesting. It, it seems interesting. Um, it, certainly, MDMA may take away the fear for many people. At the same time, it's not the same as the psychedelics, you know. It's like, a, you know, it's like having a warm bath compared to jumping into an ice yeah. sea. You know? so. Yeah. That basic approach, the sort of starting gradually, starting, this is an MDMA being an empathogen, mm. less than a full-blown psychedelic, uh, moving into the deep end of the pool slowly, gradually, making a transition. I, I think that makes a lot of sense I mean, from a therapeutic perspective because there's no value or there's not much value in plunging a person into a territory which overwhelms them, frightens them, jars them, uh, and they can't really bring back much of deep therapeutic value or even much of deep philosophical value. Mm -hmm. So slow, I think, is it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Before we leave this topic, um, can someone talk about the differences in terms of uh, ayahuasca versus smoke DMT and entity encounters? Because I've noticed there are similarities, but 
a lot of differences um, mm -hmm. with these two experiences. Yeah, well, I have, I have, I have been a few experiences with DMT. It's too, too fast. I mean, to, to bring anything, uh, uh, to bring any, so it's very difficult to compare a DMT experience with an ayahuasca experience because in, in with ayahuasca you have the time you have three four hours you know yeah. of dealing with thing with the DMT is so short it's just uh, two three four minutes you know in, 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 in there is no that with uh, Changa I, I just a couple of experiences with them it is like you know, somehow it was interesting because you had a little bit more time. You know to deal with and uh, and and so so uh, yeah I know and I and I remember I had one very interesting Chang experience talking about <laughs> about entities, which was very very interesting. You know, the, uh, I was on a path and there was this uh, and entities uh, in, in, in well beautiful costumes you know whatever and 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 leading me the way to a path. But with one hand, they were saying this way, but with the left hand or another mm -hmm. hand was telling me, no, go that way. <laughs> 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 so, so it was just like, who am I going to listen to? You? <laughs> right. and, and so I make some steps and then say, I cannot make up my mind. I'm sorry, open my eyes. <laughs> so, you know, so I didn't trust any ah. of the thoughts. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to talk about the smoke versus uh, ayahuasca? I agree with Louise. I mean, it. it I find I don't really. Uh, I've done D smoke DMT a couple of times, and uh, it's so fast. It plunges you so quickly. It's interesting experience, but it's so hard to bring material back. And in that context, I think uh, the long time window of ayahuasca is very helpful. And similarly, the long time window of LSD uh, is very beneficial because it, it's not simply a matter of having new experiences, but it's a matter of being able to let those experiences impact you. Uh, engage those experiences, work with them, be healed by those experiences. And then if you get into very, very deep territory, the long tail of ayahuasca, the long tail of LSD gives you time to process and integrate on your return. So at the end of the day, you really have brought back something, you know, substantial rather than just plunge in real quick and come out. And I know, you know, the long, the big window is an inconvenience for many people today. You know, it's just mm -hmm. inconvenient, you know, you want to get in and out. But in indigenous cultures, in truly psychedelic cultures, they consider the long window a benefit because you get to spend more time in that magical interface. Yeah, and, and like you say, Chris, you, we have to bring something back. O otherwise, why? It's like watching a fantastic film, you know, and very excited. And next day, there is nothing of it. So if we do not bring it back and change us, you know, so it is just a, a very banal exercise. Yeah. This came up in my LSD work where uh, when I was this, I was at very advanced stage of the work and I was beginning to enter into communion with what I call the diamond luminosity, the, the, the domain of sheer radiance, what Buddhism calls Dharmakaya, uh, mm -hmm. the clear light of absolute reality. And once you, once you touch that reality, all you want to do is go back to it. I mean, it's just, it, you know, it's just so magnificent. And it took me a year of another five mm -hmm. sessions of intense purification before I could go back into that reality. And then another year more purification before I could go back. And along the way, one of the things I began to realize was that there was a consciousness or, or some consciousness controlling my experiences and not letting me have too much too soon. Mm -hmm. And I began to understand that the, because the purpose of the journey 
was not simply to have new experiences. The purpose of the journey was to bring back those experiences and change your earthly existence. Right, right. In the religions of the last 5,000 years, the Axial Age religions, they all have been tend to be up and out cosmologies. So you achieve some uh, uh, moksha or nirvana and you leave when you, when you die or you achieve salvation and you go to paradise when you die. But the, va- the, the, the fruition of a spiritual life takes place off planet in some spiritual reality where the cosmology that emerged in my work was that that only represents half of the cycle. Half of the cycle is about making contact with spiritual reality, but the other half of the cycle is bringing that spiritual reality back and absorbing it deeper and deeper and deeper into your physical body, because the goal is to transform your embodied existence, not simply to have a temporary visit in a spiritual reality. And and that's not simply just a therapeutic goal, I think. I think this is an evolutionary cosmological intention that we're in it for the long term. We're in it for another million years, another billion years, another billion, billion years. We're in it for the long term. And what we're doing is synthesizing, integrating spiritual luminous reality with physical green reality. And and we do it with reincarnation. We do it with spiritual practice. We do it with meditation and we do it with psychedelics. We're integrating those realities with the net result being a deeper and deeper transformed physical experience of this magnificent universe that we are in. Yeah. I, I want to add to that. I really agree 100%. So many people on a, some kind of spiritual path, it's about escaping the body, and the body is bad, and coming into the body is some kind of horrible mistake, and we just want to get the hell out. And I think that's so wrong. <laughs> we, want to, we want to bring that, that spirit down here, just like you were saying. I think that's really, really important. And I want to have one sort of a little bit contrary note about smoked DMT. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had an experience once of, yeah, and it's, you know, only a couple of minutes, but just this blast of a super intense vision of two bejeweled serpents intertwined with each other. And they were mm-hmm. moving in a slow, powerful way. And they were absolutely riveting, fascinating, you know, like, Ah, uh, and then it, it faded, mm-hmm. you know. And I would have liked uh, I would have liked a lot more time there. But the image stuck with me and became something. I think I think that's uh, helped me grow, and I think it's been a force for my development. Mm-hmm. But it was like you know, it was like flash bulb burned into my mm-hmm. mind that mm-hmm. beautiful, seductive, bejeweled mm-hmm. image. Yeah, yeah. Before I pass it off to Paul again, I just want to share a real quick story. We had a um, Peruvian shaman visiting one time, and we're showing him all over the place, new experiences, and had the opportunity to um, have him smoke some DMT. And it was fascinating, because here's a person who's like you know, swimming in ayahuasca, pretty much, and very able to navigate those, those realms, but he got a little disoriented with it, because of, because of the quickness. And... Mm. Uh, and at one point he has his eyes closed and he's like growling, making these noises. Then he looked up and he's like almost like a child in wonderment. And then he described later, it was, he couldn't tell what was real. Like, was he a shaman in this place They're looking at us or was that other realm real <laughs> or more than the real reality? So we just, uh, I just wanted to share that because it, it was a kind of a fun, interesting experience. Um, yeah. mm. Surprising. Yeah, remind me once, uh, this happened so many years ago that now I can tell it, you know, <laughs> I'm clean. You know, that's all. <laughs> uh, uh, as, as an anthropologist, you know, I mean, that would be completely taboo. Uh, uh, but, you know, I had with me uh, some MDMA. You know, so, um, and went to see Don Emilio, my, my teacher, um, uh, he, the one who told me, you know, you have to, that ayahuasca is a teacher and there are many plant, other plant teachers and so on, even tobacco is a teacher and so on. 
So, but you, the, the way to be able to learn about these things, you have to be in isolation, keep a certain diet, you know, and so on. So you are able to, to learn with, with it. So uh, we went to the Palcasu, Palcasu River and uh, uh, where I was supposed to be um, having a diet uh, myself. But I, I, have, I have this M MDMA with me and I thought, hmm, perhaps Don Emilio, I would like to know what he thinks about it. So I gave him the, the, the MDMA. He went to uh, by the river. He was already 66 uh, years old for me. He looked very old because I was in my 30s, you know, and now I'm 70, almost 75 years old, so a young man. No? Uh, but anyway, he went to the river. He was sitting there in silence, total silence for about three hours, four hours, you know. And I didn't want to disturb him. He was, and, then, and then finally he came to me. He said, bonito, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn with it if you keep the diet. Mm. So, so he was apl applying the same thing, you know, that you have to be in isolation to give a certain diet and all this, you know, purification in order to be able to really learn from the MDMA. So, uh, so I thought it was very interesting, and and it will be, you know, how can we apply these techniques, you know, because they, they, um, the Indians know. I mean, they have been do, using this for thousands of years, you know. So you have to be in a certain situation in order to be able to learn from this um, uh, substance or plants and so on. Thank you. Uh, if you want to pass it off to Paul, I, I'm noticing it's two thirty-six, and I'm just wondering is. Uh, do any of the panelists need to leave exactly at uh, three or can you stick around a little longer, possibly? It's okay for a little longer? It's okay. Great, okay. great. Yeah. Right okay. On. So uh, Robert, we teased this uh, early on, but I'm wondering um, if you can talk a little bit more about um, how do you know if you're, if you're dealing with a part of yourself, one of the, one of the parts or an entity, if you're, if you're, if you're speaking to the, such a thing? What do you think? This is an incredibly important question. Mm -hmm. And I think the big mistake that's been made in the past is people try and get rid of a part of themselves thinking it's an entity. And that mm. causes so much damage. Like, I love chocolate. <laughs> and there are other parts of me who are really worried about my belly. <laughs> the parts of me that are worried about my belly point to the one who loves chocolate and say, that's an entity, get that SOB out of here. <laughs> and, and all sorts of stuff like that, a lot more serious, like alcoholics often have that kind of experience and it's really another part of them. So the, the, the number one question I ask is, what's your intention? You know, why, why do you not like that part who loves chocolate? What's, what's your intention in this? Or I ask the chocolate loving part, why do you like that? Even with like a suicidal part, many of them, they're parts and they have a really good intention. And what's, why do you do that? Well, then she'd be off the planet. Well, what's good about her being off the planet? Then she wouldn't be suffering anymore. Mm -hmm. That's a part. It's ready to sacrifice everything to save that person from suffering. That's a part. You want to welcome it, help it come in, you know, all of this stuff. But if you go to some being or thing inside that wants to kill the person, why do you, she wouldn't be on the planet anymore. What's good about her not being on the planet anymore? And sometimes this takes like six or eight questions, one after another. Well, that means I would have won. <laughs> you know, that's probably an entity. Yeah. But intention and really drill down because a lot of these parts don't seem to have a good intention at the beginning. And then the second thing I've discovered, and it's not just me, if you ask the being directly, are you a part of her? Or you have the person ask, are you a part of her system? Are you a part of my system? They don't seem to be able to lie. They lie about everything else, <laughs> but this one, they seem to be, they don't. And most of the time they'll try and avoid answering the question. And I had one, it avoided, you know, and then I was teaching. So I was supervising the therapist 
and it said, you're supposed to be a teacher. That's a really stupid question. Don't you have anything smarter to ask? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it might be really stupid, but it's really simple. Are you a part of her? And then it roared back, no, I'm not. I'm a much more powerful being and I'm gonna crush you like a worm the same way I'm gonna crush her. Interesting. That mm -hmm. was not a part of her system. So those are the two things, intention, 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 directly ask the thing, the thing itself, are you a part? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, um, Brad and I have encountered shaman that have said, um, sure, I've encountered entities and others that have said, uh, no, not at all, don't believe in it whatsoever. What's been your experience, uh, the three of you, as far as uh, shaman and their, and their attitudes towards entities? Uh, Luis? Mm -hmm. Well, mm, of course, every, all the, my teachers that are dead now from a long time ago in the 80s, they, they were all, they all, of course, had seen entities, the spirits of, of the plants and the animals, they called it the madre and so on. But it made me think now, with the, your question is, I was thinking of my own teacher, Don Emilio, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and he was a, uh, he was uh, also afraid of uh, of spirits of certain spirits. I mean, the thing is that in the Amazon they have the they have this idea that the shaman is um, is part of being a shaman, be able to to harm. I mean, you know, you you have a, a well. I mean, oh, let's put it in this way: when when the, you get into this world, the first thing that you are offered is some kind of power. You know, yes. you are able to do this. You can, you know, do harm. And then you have to uh, su uh, surpass this temptation in order to be able to become a healer. But there is an in-between. There are people who are stuck in both worlds, you know. So they have the power to do harm and the, and the, and the, and the power uh, to heal. And very often, I don't know whether this is some, well, we don't know how old ayahuasca is really, you know, I mean, the soil anthropologist in the, in, the, in the Peruvian Amazon, perhaps it's not very, very old, 250 years, perhaps, uh, you know, in other areas, uh, different thing, you know, but th there is this idea in the Peruvian Amazon of fight. All, the, uh, when you, go there, I don't know now, because uh, I have not been there for many years, but the, you always talk to a, a, a shaman and he will tell you about the, the bad shamans out there, you know? Mm. Uh, so so there is uh, warfare and and they believe in these darts, you know, they call it, um, yes. um, I don't remember now the, the, the name, uh, the, you know, the darts that they say. So it is warfare, you know, when you go to the Peruvian Amazon, uh, at least uh, in my time, it was like, my goodness, you know. And, uh, and so Don Emilio himself, he had been hurt by one virote, they use the word virote, mm -hmm. virote, but they, even the word virote is very interesting because it is the the arrow thrown by cross, um, you know, the ballestas in Spanish. Uh, um, in the, when the Spaniards went to the Amazon, they could not use a powder, you know, uh, they got humid, they could not, uh, you know, so they were using the ballestas, which is a crossbow. crossbow. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so they use the, the term virote, which is the, the, the arrow, for those illnesses. And so they are all the time about this. So shamanism is about extracting, extracting these virotes, throwing them back to the person who caused it. It's just warfare. And so Don Emilio, my teacher, was in that, that sphere, you know. Uh, now, uh, uh, in my own work uh, later on, I simply refuse to accept that worldview of, warfares and all this. Simply, I say, no. I, I mean, they not here. You know? <laughs> not here, they do not come. And so, and so somehow, I never had any kind of encounters or with enemies or this kind of thing. So, so always good ones. Um, so, even though they can be frightening, uh, as well, again, you know, you accept that they, they are. They, it, is not, it is not their fault that they look so ugly, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you want to weigh in on that as far as your experience with shaman and their belief in entities or not? Uh, 
I really can't because I really have not worked with any shamans. I mean, I've read Uh, books by shamans and about shamans. um, But in all my psychedelic work, I really have only had one teacher, and that teacher is the universe. I mean, everything I've learned has been taught to me by the universe. And now, of course, uh, my Stan Groff has been a huge influence on me through his books and whatnot, and a colleague and um, but I haven't had, in fact, one of the things which has really kind of put me off about some of the, you know, the, the, on the, on the ground practical matters of shamanism is exactly what Louise has described all this combative, yes. you know, light shamans, dark shamans, antagonistic and fighting and whatnot. And none of like you, Louise, none of that appealed to me whatsoever. I mean, yeah. we've got better things to do with our time in these <laughs> in these realities and to play those kind of silly games, you know? Uh, yeah. So, but I don't have any experience with shamans uh, themselves, gotcha. except Louise. <laughs> Robert, Robert, how about you? Any, any encounters with shaman one way or the other? Uh, yeah. My wife is Korean and they have an amazing shamanic tradition, the mudang. They're mostly women, okay. but some men and uh, they all believe in spirits. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. They, uh, it's universal. And um, I also worked in Pakistan introducing IFS there. They all believe in spirits, jinn in the, you know, the is- Islamic language. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I've been working lately with indigenous people in America and Canada. They all believe in spirits. I think that's, you know, understandably, they don't like white guys too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's you go there and they go, they're like mm, another one of these idiots and and i think the reason they sort of gave me a little bit of a entree was that i did believe in spirits mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. know they thought well maybe this guy isn't as stupid as he looks you know <laughs> so, so my experience is pretty much <laughs> universal that uh, they be- they believe and accept spirits do you find that the indigenous people in general are accepting of your IFS uh, practices? Very much, because the a basic principle of IFS is we as the therapist are not the healer. It's the person's self, and we help the person form a better relationship between their self and, and the, all their parts. Mm-hmm. So I'm not coming in there like another white expert telling them what to do. Right. That's what really pisses them off. And it's interesting, they tend to hate the Ivy League universities the most. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think because those are, you know, the certified experts and they can't get off that stuff. Yeah. Interesting. You know, Bob, you mentioned, you're mentioning your wife. I think we should acknowledge a, a major limitation of our panel is that we're all men. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. And, Man, male psychedelic experience, and most of the books are being written by men. And it's an assumption that male psychedelic experience is the same, that female psychedelic experience is the same. And we're not, that's not at all demonstrated. And we have every reason to think that female women's psychedelic experience is different in many core fundamental ways than, than men's. And my wife is an example who has a, a lot of psychedelic experience. And she has a, we overlap, of course, but she has a different uh, access, mode of access, a set of insights that emerge, a different relationship with her body, a different relationship with the earth. And so let, let's just remind ourselves that we need women in this conversation. Certainly, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Brad, you wanna take it? Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that point came up too because uh, someone immediately when I posted this, the, the critique was, uh, where are the women? Where are the others? And, uh, you know, it's a valid point and it would have been nice to have it, but then again, didn't want the panel to be too big and it just inspires me to have more co- more panels like this. Maybe we'll have an all-women panel and uh, mm-hmm. I would like to get someone from uh, Africa uh, to talk about yep. that, that whole thing and the different right. parts of the world, the Asian countries. Yes. So, Yes. This is just, uh, you, you know, hopefully at the beginning we'll have more things like this, yeah. get different voices, because uh, you, know, you have two white guys and, you know, uh, Luis and uh, yeah. nothing against you guys, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, 
You know, with uh, three men with books in the back. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I know. So, so I'm, I'm aware of the, uh, the you know, limited yeah. number of perspectives here. And I, I'm sensitive now to hear that. And we'll, we'll hopefully have more panels like this with uh, um, different diverse populations and uh, different mm -hmm. So, but I just want to follow up. Uh, so, someone mentioned. Could, could, I, could I come in for a minute, Brad? Sure. Um, you mentioned Asia, and I just wanted to say something. Everybody, uh, yeah, I, too many books. <laughs> I don't have that. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> He's been transformed. <laughs> um, back when I was studying anthropology, they were all predicting, oh, we have to go to societies that still have possession rituals because that's going to die out. And we have to rush and do it right now. The opposite is happening. They're mm -hmm. way more and they're flourishing all over the world, especially in Taiwan, because mm -hmm. there was this incredible underground tradition in China that was suppressed and kept hidden by the communist regime. And once they're in Taiwan, it's totally flourishing. There are mm -hmm. all these shamanic mm -hmm. possession uh, cults, I, I don't like that word, but whatever you want to call them, flourishing over there, Singapore, Malaysia, all over there. So I just wanted to mention oh. that. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Taiwan too, because I, I, you know, I was adopted and I'm, I'm half Taiwanese, but I've never been to Taiwan, but uh, hmm. I, part, my father was part of the indigenous people there. So it just inspires me more to learn more about that. Uh, that whole hmm. area. So thank you for that. And yeah. um, there was a question, follow up when uh, Robert, when you're telling your story about um, finding out that uh, um, what you're dealing with was an entity and not a part. The question was uh, incredible story, Robert. Can you elaborate on how you dealt with that entity? Oh, um, yeah. Okay. It originally appeared in the person looking like an internal critic. Now, almost everybody has an internal critic part. You know, it's telling you, get up, brush your teeth, your shirt's not straight, you didn't work hard, you know, all that stuff. And it's, it's trying to do you good. But this one had no good intention, no good intention anywhere. And it appeared in this woman, it looked like a bloodshot eyeball with the legs of a goat. Ooh. And we were, uh, once it identified itself that way, I just surrounded it in light, which was her preferred metaphor. I, I use light a lot. It's big in the West, but it was her choice, really. Got it out. It tried to sneak back in, got it out again, and it stayed out. And this was the first big case. And I, I debriefed the other people in the class and then went to a staff meeting, and my core body temperature dropped like four degrees. And mm -hmm. I could not get warm. I was just shaking and shaking, even with blankets and people holding me. And then as this woman was going home from the training, she sent me all these page long and longer emails saying, I've never seen colors like this before. And everybody in the airport looks like God. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I triggered a manic episode. There goes, there goes the license, you know. <laughs> and then she sent me another email that really scared me. She said, I didn't tell you this, but back when I was young, I was tried to kill myself many times and was repeatedly institutionalized. And now I'm really worried. And then she sent me an email that changed my life. She said, Bob, you're the first person who ever took me seriously when I talked about the non-human inside of me. You've changed my life. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. And I wanted to ignore this. It completely upset my expertise. <laughs> you know, I went from thinking I was an expert to thinking I knew nothing and was an absolute beginner. <laughs> But when she wrote that, and she, she said more, she said, back then, if I talked about this, they gave me electroshock. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like, man, we're so, I, I could not ignore it after that. And it, in the 10, 12 years since then, I've really focused on this stuff because most other therapists won't touch it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're writing a book now about this. Yeah. That's great. Great. What's the timeline for the book? When do you think the book will be finished? Oh, first draft should be done in the fall, but I, I've been 10 years on it, so. <laughs> um, uh, we, we look forward to it. Yeah. 
Yeah, in this context, I'd like to mention just uh, the work of Thomas Zinzer. He's yes, a, a yes. yes, Soul Centered Healing, three yeah. volumes, clinical, just what Bob has been talking about. Uh, identification, ego fragments, past life fragments, dark entities, a hierarchy of dark entities, uh, really uh, decades and decades. And what's unusual about Tom is that he, he developed this work in dialogue, in weekly dialogue with a discarnate presence that went by the name of Jared. So every week he was meeting through a channel and having a conversation with the spiritual being who could see his clients from the spiritual perspective and would give him specific guidance on how to manage blockages that he was dealing with with his clients. And then he would go into practice during the week and, and do use the advice. And then he would come back the following week and tell him how it went. And he kept this up for 15 years and thousands and thousands of, of pages of transcripts. And then he began to write it up in a series of books. Uh, and the, the first one is soul-centered healing. And so how he describes his practice. And when I listen to you, Robert, I just, I hear my friend, Tom Zinzer. Yeah. yeah he's a friend of mine too. And we've taught uh -huh. together and I've yeah. met him and he lives in a town in the Midwest, Grand Rapids, Michigan, about yeah. as conservative a place as you can find in America. And yeah. he's, very neat, well organized, trim, you know, the uh -huh. image of a conservative guy. And he, he's, I so admire his courage because he has been ridiculed and hounded. And, you know, all these people have told him he was nuts. He nearly lost his license, yeah. but he, he would not be quiet. He's, this is real. This yeah. is real. It's time we spoke up. This is real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my piggyback, there's a question from the audience here that I think is good and kind of uh, is along the same vein of uh, what to do when you encounter an entity. Uh, it's, could you share on the topic of deep possession work during the psychedelic ceremonies where a participant of a, psychedel uh, of a psychedelic are in their experience and an entity comes forward up to the surface, speaking to where a shaman facilitator would compassionately support the suffering entity to move away from the person and instead move towards a more suitable place for both the entity and the person. What are your thoughts, uh, knowledge on this topic? Mm. So I know we kind of already addressed this a little bit, but I, I like the way this was phrased. That we want to, so how do we deal with this process? I mean, how do we get this entity out in a loving way? Hmm. Well, I'll go, I'll go if nobody else is ready. Yeah. Uh, my first rule is follow the person's mythology, follow their imagery, follow what they want. Um, and just, just to remember, I'm the village idiot here. <laughs> They're the expert. They know. I'm, you know, I'm just like this helper on the side. And many of the Brazilian spiritists who I've met use smoky quartz. And I knew this one person who had these chunks of smoky quartz and would have the person take one in each hand and say, let that energy go into the smoky quartz. And then the, the person would work with that. And then they'd take the smoky quartz outside, put it on the earth so the energies could drain out into the earth. But that was basically the imagery and mythology of the person doing the medicine. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, concerning the possession, um, or better, the, the way the Brazilians say it is incorporation, because different possession, you lose yourself, but incorporation, uh, there is inside you, you, you know yourself, but you also know the entity inside you, you know. So, so I have seen in, in this Barquinha uh, church that I studied, uh, that even the, sometimes I have been uh, seen a couple, uh, uh, husband and wife, which are both um, mediums and are able to incorporate the spirits. And one of them consulting the, the other one under the influence of this spirit. So, so I have seen how a woman was consulting with the 
Preto Bello with the spirit inside the body of her husband and consulting with this spirit their mater, mater, uh, uh, marital problems, you know, <laughs> which I thought that it was extraordinary that, that you consult with your partner, <laughs> but there's the spirit there who is giving you advice about your own relationship, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyone else on uh, how to deal with um, the entities um, that come up in ceremony? Hasn't been part of my experience, so. There's a, there's a question from uh, somebody posted this. Um, can we treat dark or malevolent entities, unattached burdens by feeding them with love as in the tradition and millennial practice of the Tibetan chod? Chod, chod. Um, anyone want to speak to that as far as bathing, with, bathing them with love? Uh, Robert, you've probably done that, right? Well, not exactly. I had one client, uh, she had gone to an ayahuasca ceremony that was very poorly controlled and something got in her that was really nasty and going home from the ayahuasca thing she lost control of herself and her car was locked up in the mental institution her oh. parents came out to california from from the midwest driving her home she was institutionalized four more times because they couldn't contain her in the car so this lady was really severely severely in trouble and when she got home she had a cousin who was a psychic and the psychic said just say to this thing i have nothing here for you but love over and over and over as your mantra and this woman did that and the thing stopped bothering her Mm. And she came to me after that for more help later. And in working with her, she wasn't sure if it was the author of love, the offer of love, which this being found repulsive. It didn't want anything to do with love. It, I'm out of here. Or it just made it super crystal clear to her that this was not a part of her. Mm -hmm. But it, it did work. And then, you know, we did more work later to help her get more stable in, in her recovery. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This is a fascinating topic. I want to jump into something kind of related. I, I've known two instances of people saying that um, someone put an entity into them. And this is during ayahuasca. Um, from uh, like a, a bad shaman or something. I don't know if have, have any of you heard of that. And, um, and if so, how can we protect ourselves uh, going into ceremony if, from something like that happening? Mm, well, it has not happened uh, uh, in my experience. Uh, I, I remember one occasion uh, I used to tell people that, uh, well, that that's what they say in the Amazon, that if you are on the effects of ayahuasca and then you see an entity inviting you, follow me, follow me, you never, you never say yes. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in, in the Amazon, they said that you can, you can have an entity and you go follow and you get lost in the forest and then, and you, you know, and, and it can be terrible. I mean, eaten by insects and all this, they can find you in a very poor state later on. If um, So I always say that to, to the people and, uh, and one woman said that she was uh, not in, in the space where I was and um, went out and then saw an Indian, <laughs> but this was, didn't happen in the Amazon, and it was just inviting, you know, and then she remembered what I said, and she said, no, and then she said that this, this Indian, you know, came close to her and touched her in the forehead and then disappeared, and of course, she was very, very frightened by this, you know, and um, so I did some kind of work, um, yeah, yeah, um, but nothing bad happened after, you know, I mean, what I do is uh, suck out, you know, and, you know, and, and um, it's, I, I don't like usually to talk about this kind of work because it's very personal. But anyway, what I do is just take it out and throw it, you know, go back to whatever. But I don't know whether it is, it is true. I mean, because uh, 
I'm not sure about the reality of these entities. I mean, as I said, I think that this is this interface of me and whatever is out there is some intelligence. And so, so this, these entities, I don't know what is their ontology really, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. You know, Robert Monroe at the Monroe Institute, he taught because he's working with people with sounds and going into going into non-ordinary states and out-of-body states or something approximating that. And he taught a, a, a mantra that would be used, a prayer that would be used at the beginning of every session, which is basically uh, and a, a psychological exercise where you wrap yourself in a cocoon of white light and you basically reject any influence of any being of lower development than you and you invite influence from any beings who are higher of influence than you. So the basic mm -hmm. standard protocol, uh, white light protection and a clear statement of intention, I'm not available uh, for any influence negative to me. And I, I follow this in a way in, in all of my psychedelic practice. I, I never go into psychedelic space without doing very careful spiritual preparation. Mm -hmm. When I learned, one of the questions mentioned the Tibetan practice of Chud, which is one of my favorite practices. And what, and I once I learned Chud, I always do Chud before going into any psychedelic space. Um, and so it's a purification process. It's a feeding the demons practice. It's a clearing obstacles. But, uh, and I do a very, very strong. And first, I'm also, you know, I'm taking care of my body and diet and, and yoga and, and uh, even chiropractic to make sure my body is aligned. Because when you go into these super high energy states, if your body is not aligned, you're going to feel that pain. Once I... Once I set that context and once I do the practice and do the spiritual practice, then I open myself completely in complete trust to whatever comes. For me, I haven't had much dealings with entities that come, but I have had a lot of experience with collective fields of suffering entering into the helm realms, entering into realms populated by thousands and hundreds of thousands of beings in, ac in acute suffering, terrible anger, terrible anguish. And, and, you know, it's like all the people who have died in war is where is where have those memories gone? All the terrible things we've done to each other through history, where have those, if those experiences are unintegrated and unreconciled before a person dies, where does it go? And, and of course, in many Eastern cosmologies, it, it goes into the bardo, it goes into the hell realm or the hungry ghost realm. And in my experience, I, I have spent years entering into the hell realms of terrible violence, tremendous, tremendous violence and anger. And uh, I would say in some way, I embrace it with love, but my fundamental commitment was to embrace it by accepting it and letting myself experiencing it and trusting that this process was, was intentional. It was purposive. It, I didn't enter into this through accident. I, I entered this all my psychedelic experience through very careful alignment of my intention to the possibilities and in service of the higher good and the collective good. And what I found was after going into this, what I call the ocean of suffering for two years, over a two-year period, uh, I began to understand that the therapeutic work that I was doing really wasn't about me personally. It, it wasn't a displacement of sh personal shadow or anything like that, that something had was working with me to use the hours that we I was in this condition to bring about a healing of some aspect of the collective psyche of the collective unconscious which you know because the collective psyche is burdened by our humanity's history just as our personal psyche is burdened by our unresolved personal trauma, traumatic history. So the collective psyche is bother, is, carries the burden of its trauma. But if you engage that trauma, 
if you engage that pain and suffering, and I, this is not something I would recommend everyone. I don't think it's everybody's karma to do this. I wouldn't recommend it as a carte blanche kind of thing, but it certainly was my karma to engage it consciously. Uh, and it brought great blessings in the end, because as always, anything you do for another, because the world is one, it comes back to you in some form as a blessing. So if you, if you give something of service and if you help someone with their pain, even if it's a collective field of pain, if you make yourself available as a healing influence, it's going to come back to you in some form somewhere down the road. And it certainly did for me. Yeah. Thank you for doing that work, uh, Chris. I, I remember reading your book. Uh, it just didn't sound like a very pleasant experience. And to go back in that repeatedly, uh, I admire your courage and uh, willingness to do that. Yeah. Um, I, w- I want to say something to that question, too. I think the basic protection is not being afraid. Mm-hmm. If you have frightened parts, forming a loving connection with them so that you're not like squashing them down. You know, it, it, this is actually one of the blessings, I think, of meeting entities. You get to meet all your frightened parts. Mm-hmm. And it, it brings them forth. That's really a blessing, even though it can be difficult. So I try to discourage people from doing anything else. You know, stick with this most basic thing. If you're not afraid of it in the inner world, it loses all power. Mm -hmm. You're you're okay. But there is one meditation that I've come across that helps many people, and it's called the ceiling light meditation. And you just ask people to focus on the center of light or warmth within their body, wherever they find it. And you, you you ask them, open all your senses to it, focus on it, let it grow, watch it as it fills your body all the way to the skin and then notice any dark places or obstructions don't fight those those are important trailheads those are parts we want to come back and meet and get to know once it's all the way to your skin then let it go poof out of you and extend out about two feet all around you Mm -hmm. and when people start doing this it takes them 30 minutes 40 minutes you know to go through it but if you practice it a while, you can do it in a couple breaths, five seconds. Yeah. So a lot of people find that if they practice that ahead of time, very helpful thing to, that they can do. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you mind if I do one more? No, go for it. Go for it. Um, so there's this whole notion that, uh, like, I don't know if you've seen Twin Peaks, uh, where I mean, there's a notion about having to invite an entity inside of you uh, to let them in. You know, the whole thing about a vampire can't enter your house unless you invite them in, something like that. So, um, which brings you the, the, the notion of mediumship, which is already mentioned, or channeling. And uh, are there any um, risks involved with channeling, like letting something inside of you? Because I'm assuming you have to somehow give your consent to do that. But what if something comes in that you would have a hard time getting out? Um, does anyone want to address that issue? Is that again about fears and facing your fears and, and not giving them power or is it something else? You know, I think when, I mean, I'm going to yield to Robert on this one, but my sense is that entities as such that get slipped inside of us and become part of our fabric, come in through a weakness or come in through a fear or come in through a a hurt or injury. And it promises us some type of protection if it allows it itself in. And this is a very different phenomenon than channeling where you know you you're consciously opening yourself up into dialogue with a, an entity and you can take spiritual precautions to make sure you're not opening yourself up to a malevolent influence and you're in some type of conscious rapport with an entity that's that's very different than an entity inside you think robert yeah yeah 
Uh, Louis, do you have something you want to say about this one? I don't know. I don't know. I'm <laughs> thinking. Mm. No, I, I have not experienced. Well, uh, okay. One little thing now. <laughs> uh, um, well, usually, you know, um, it is one of my principles never open your eyes when you are in the, an experience out of fright, you know? I mean, so you have to go through it, you know? Whatever it is, you know, don't open your eyes because it's a defeat in a way, and you will go, you know? So, yeah. but I, it happened to me once that I, I, I opened my eyes. <laughs> and, and it was, it, I saw this entities, like, they look more like, like, um, those uh, um, UFO things, you know, mm -hmm. um, big eyes, you know, and and so they were looking at me, and they say we are going to put this inside you, and at that moment I said no way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no way, no way, I'm not, you know, and simply you know, they, and so I said no, I'm sorry. I opened my eyes and called a friend and said no, 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 <laughs> let be, let's be here a little bit, you know because um, then I'm not going to let it happen. Later on, I was thinking why I was, why I didn't do it. You know, I should have done it. You know, I said, okay, just put it in and see what happens, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so, so in a way, you know, it's a pity. It's a pity. You know? <laughs> <laughs> when I was in the, uh, the Ibingen conference in Mexico, that, where you were at, Luis, yeah. Um, there was someone, I, and I tried to look up his name, I couldn't find it, but he was doing something with measuring the energy field, like he had a computer and it showed like, it, it show. I don't know if it's based on curling photography or something like that, but showed the strength of your energy field and like chinks in the armor, so to speak. And he showed differences like when people drink alcohol, for example, there's, there's weaker energy and there's chinks in the armor. And um, even after ayahuasca, sometimes like uh, you, you might be more susceptible um, and then showed different ways of strengthening that like how, if people do certain things then it's strengthened um, I just want to get all your thoughts on that is do you think that is uh, does that sound right to you is there like chinks in the armor that from like drinking alcohol sort of or different harmful substances you know you made me think of a concept that I found in the Amazon it's called the arcana you know, uh, it, it is, they describe it as some, so, some sort of shield, you know, then it, it, that the shaman will put on you to protect you. And among the Shipibo, this shield takes the form of those, the typical Shipibo patterns, you know, they are so very popular. Many people have been to the Amazon and they bring this fantastic, um, you know, the iconography in on the shirts and so on, and skirts and so on. So, so the, for them, this is the pattern, you know. So you, they, you said that we all, us, all of us, we have this kind of, some kind of pattern, you know, with like some armor. And for the Shipibo, the illness is distortion in the patterns, so that somehow you pan are not together, and so you are open to disease, you know. And and one of the things that they do, they 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 call the hummingbird, you know. And the, there is a song, and the coming hummingbird will come, and with the wings will make music and will restore the patterns, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Amazon, very often, and I think in the shamanism everywhere. I mean, I'm not completely sure about that, but the importance that songs have in, you know, everywhere in the shaman, you know. So in the Amazon, they will say, they will sing the song so that they will restore the pattern. When I was myself doing the diet with the, with Don, um, uh, oh, I, I forgot the name, uh, uh, people shaman, um, I, I spent a month with him. Um, oh, it would come to me the name. I mean. um, Anyway, I had a month with him, and then he said, um, well, I said, I'm tomorrow I'm going back to, to Pucallpa. He was in, in the 80s. And then he said, okay, now I'm going to put you in Arcana so that you are protected when you go back. And um, so he was singing a song. And then I said, 
what is this? And he took one of those skirts, of the Chibibo skirts, and showed them to me and said, I'm putting this on you. Now, I said this because there was a, a whole polemic. There was an uh, uh, Angelika Gebhardt-Sayer, an anthropologist, German anthropologist, who mentioned this, who said that in the Chipibo, all healing, it is through songs, you know. And, and then she's saying that, in a way, the song is like, like, not a script, you know. I mean, you know. So it is like something is putting on you. And some people interpre interpret that as being a, like a, a transcription, you know, somehow of music. And this pattern is that music. And of course, it is not like that, you know. Uh, uh, but anyway, all healing among the Shibibu people is about mu musicali musicality, putting songs into you and, and also perfumes, you know. So so yeah. that is, you know, so the, the, the shield. So that, that that is my experience, you know, the, of, of having this kind of, of Schill, um, uh, uh, which in, in fact, you know, I have to say this was in the 80s, you know, once I was taking ayahuasca with another shaman and then and then he said, ah, oh, so you got this, you know. So he was seeing that arcana that somebody had put on me. Uh, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone else want to comment about the protective energy field and even the ability to to look at it technologically, do you think that's real? Um... Okay, you don't have to answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I just realized I do have to go in a few minutes, but I'm really yeah. loving this conversation, Luis yeah. and Chris. It's a delight to meet you and get to, and get to talk with you, and Brad and all the rest of you too. Delightful. And I think it's so important that we're talking about this and not just sweeping it under the carpet. So much damage gets done by the isolation the silence causes. And people suffer alone and, and largely needlessly. Yeah. And I remember Michael Harner, somebody asked him when he was 87 and almost dead, could you sum up your life's work? And I thought that was an amazingly sort of arrogant question, but he thought for a few minutes and he said, yeah, spirits are real. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all he said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, well, Robert, we it's been good to meet you too. And Luis, always good to spend time with you. Right. And nice to meet you, Robert. Really enjoyed our discussion very much. And uh, that the entity discussion, which triggers so much anxiety and fear and misunderstanding in indigenous cultures and shamanic cultures, is just a matter of fact thing. It's just like, mm -hmm. it's just natural. It's the, it's the way we relate to bacteria or something that we take antibiotics for. You can do it spiritually and energetically and vibrationally. It's just part of spiritual hygiene. You know, and it's just, it's a natural thing. Caution, respect, but not fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice yeah, if somebody asks me, you know, all these years, you know, 50 years of psychedelic, at the end I come just to animism. You know, everything is, you know, my mind is everywhere. I mean, you know, we are blind, you know, but it's, it's everywhere. So so this idea of are we alone, I mean, it's totally <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is always looking in the outer world. If we look inside, we find it's right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was said, what you said, Robert, about um, just, just talking about this, getting this into the conversation, how important it is. And it, last, last time we had a panel, it was on death and dying. And it's the same thing. We're, we're just our conversations about death and dying in this culture are so, we hide death. You know, we don't, we don't see people die. We don't see what, you know, and there's such a fear around it. So having the conversations just get it, make it normalize in it makes it a lot less scary. And I, I think I speak for a lot of people here, but this panel has, you know, lessened, you know, my anxiety, not that it had a lot, but um, I hope it's in, uh, do the same for other people here too, because uh, and this is the way to do it, to talk about it in the open and just kind of flush it out. Mm -hmm. with people, you know, That's right. You know, so I, I really, really appreciate all you being on here. And, yes, um, thank you all. 
Mm-hmm. I just want to say I just put my website address in the chat, robertfalconer.us. Pretty easy if anyone wants to get in touch with me. Yeah, do the same, Luis, and uh, and. Uh, yeah, you want Luis, I'm hoping to come down to Brazil soon because I okay. have people in Brazil and want to want to uh, introduce IFS to Brazilians. I so. see. Okay. Well, I mean, let me know. I also put my website there. I, are you organize two, three seminars per year here in, in Brazil? Uh, and uh, just for a few people, seven, eight people most, you know. So, so if anybody uh, would like to, you know, I, I put just the, the website. It's just very tiny, you know. It, it's just my home and about 400 species of plants around us, you know, uh-huh. for me the... The, the the emphasis of this place is the garden, you know, the, all these entities around. So mm-hmm. we have about 400 species. And in fact, that's what I'm going to present in the ESP 55 with Dennis. In, now in May, I am going to present the garden together with uh, Dale Millar, who is a South African anthropologist, a genius, you know, uh, in, a plant, in the plant world. So we are going to just to present the garden. So I'm going to present the entities, you know, yeah. <laughs> around me. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. All right. I just want to say, you know, all, I mean, all three of you are welcome to come back anytime you want to talk about pretty much anything. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we started a book club thing. So definitely, Robert, when you have your book out, we'd love to have oh, you yes. talk about yes. it. Um, yeah. And uh, same with you, uh, um, Luis and uh, Chris. I mean, any book you want to come and talk about. I, mean, I know your books have been out for a while about LSD and the mind of the universe, but I, I'd love to have you on to talk about that again. Be Thank glad you. to. So Thank much. You. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, I, I want to do, like I mentioned before, I, I'd love to do this with maybe an all women panel if anyone has any suggestions mm-hmm. for that. Uh, if anyone know, has contacts with uh, someone uh, from African, you know, talk about Iboga or uh, someone from an uh, Asian mm-hmm. country um, or anywhere else you think, you know, South America. I mean, I, Luis, you're not speaking for everyone in South America, so I think we can have another person from there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I, Paul, do you want to say anything? You have any no, I think, I, think uh, I think we've covered it, but thank you very much. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, my uh, my concerns or or, or or questions about entities have, have somewhat been answered, and, and uh, I, I thought the conversation was wonderful. So thank you all. Hmm. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Yeah, thank you, the organizers. Thank you. Really, okay. lots of love, yeah. love and blessings. Yeah. Bye, Chris. Okay. Bye, Robert. Pleasure That's to fine. meet you. Please let me let me know when you come to Brazil. Okay. I will. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you all so much.